Welcome to the Level Up Podcast, presented by The Ultimate Gamer, a show that features conversations with trailblazers, thought leaders, risk takers, decision makers, celebrities, athletes, and investors who are defining the gaming and esports space. On Level Up, we take a journey into this dynamic industry and start to decode and reveal who and what's making news. It's about connecting and it's about sharing the stories and vision of the people who make gaming and esports a global phenomenon. And now, please welcome your host, student of the game and connector to the esports community, Tommy Knapp. What's up, everyone? I'm Tommy Knapp, and this is an all-new episode of the Level Up Podcast presented by The Ultimate Gamer. On today's show, I have a conversation with Kevin Wazalewski, CEO and co-founder of Origin PC, delivering the best PC experience in the world with a focus on customization, service quality, and performance. That is the Origin PC way. Before starting Origin PC, Kevin gathered over 15 years of professional experience with leading companies such as Dell, Alienware, and GameStop. We started our conversation talking about Kevin's superhero gaming avatar, a take on Hitman's Agent 47, designed by local artists that he met at Supercon. We quickly shifted gears into fighting disease by commandeering, that's donating, the power of your PC to accelerate research, therapeutics, and cures. Wow. Once we got into gaming and Origin PC, Kevin blows my mind with his depth of knowledge about the industry. When he mentions discrete math, I know I'm in trouble. He then shares about the Origin PC way and Steam saving PC gaming, real-time tracing, and finally, the fully immersive world of VR and Half-Life Alex. What? Gamers really do have the coolest lives. Join me now with Kevin Wazalewski. So thank you, first of all. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Appreciate it. So one of the first things I want to ask you, we're starting right, we're going, right? Yeah, man. Drop right into it. Tearing into it. Uh, Dude, on your LinkedIn page, uh, and I'm not on it now, but I noticed it the other day, you have one of the coolest avatars I've seen. Oh, yes. (laughs) I was about to tell you about that. So Yeah, man, share. I want to hear. Yeah, that's actually a local artist. Okay. Uh, Local artist, uh, DeLeon is his name. Um, He uh, gave that to me as a birthday gift. So to kind of go to the beginning of the story, Right. I met him at a local gaming event, uh, video games slash comic book um, event. And he had a booth where he was doing various uh, artwork. So he was doing like comic book artwork, but he also has some video game artwork. Okay. So I was looking through his video game artwork and I was like, wow, this is really cool. Could you maybe make a custom piece for me? And um, I ended up commissioning him. He made a custom piece for me. Uh, and we're actually redoing that piece uh, because it got damaged and, and a leak. Um, so one day I'll show you that that piece. But yeah, so so explain that to me. Wait, so, so I, I want to know where, when, when when was that and what was the event? And then this is is this a hard piece? So this isn't a digital piece. Yeah. Physical, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So he had physical pieces there. I was like looking through all of them, and um, he had this one where it was like a, a few video game players. Um, I think it was either video game or comic book uh, characters, and okay. they were playing poker. It was like okay. you know dogs playing poker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. type of uh, artwork. <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is really cool, but I would like to customize this to like my favorite video game characters. Right. And he's like, sure, man, we can do whatever you want. So he was super awesome. We worked with them like over a long period of time, giving him like all sorts of ideas. Can you do this video game reference, this video game reference? I ended up with like 20 or 30 video game references in this one piece of artwork. Wow. And I had it hanging on my wall for like years. And I met him. I met his uh, girlfriend or fiance. I, I'm not sure if it is. Um, and we just became friends. So we, we, we remained in contact over the years. The event was Supercon. Okay. So this was Supercon like five years ago or something. It was a long time ago. Okay. And I have to look up his, uh, his website so I can give him some love and people can check him out. Because he's still, obviously, he's still doing artwork today and anybody can commission him. They could buy his current artwork or current commission stuff. So, um, so we did this piece and we became friends and then um, you know, years later, I ended up having a party at my house, like a Vegas themed uh, birthday party. So I wasn't I invited. Him. I wasn't invited, man. Yeah, this was before we met. So <laughs> you'll be invited to the next one. <laughs> cool. um, 
Uh, and yeah, so so he showed up, and not only did he show up to the party, which I was super happy, it was just for him showing up. Yeah, he gave me an, a gift, and I'm like, oh crap, what is this? And he created that that artwork. So it's that's basically awesome. a take on Hitman. That's Agent Forty Seven on Hitman. Okay, but it's me like as Agent Forty Seven. So it's like a, a video game themed. Art. And I was like, man, this is so cool. Uh, it was a physical piece that he gave to me. So I just took a picture of it and I used that as my avatar and all my social media. And I still yeah, use man. it today. It it's was like two years cool. ago. It's super cool. I love it. And, and uh, so, but the one thing, how did he, so I wonder how he came up with it. Cause I'm thinking about you sitting there like back in the day when the a painter had to paint his subject, you know, you're sitting on a stool for hours at a time. I'm assuming he didn't have to do that. He just kind of, you must've sent him an image or something and he worked from that. Yeah, exactly. So because I had him commissioned for this other piece of work, artwork, with the video game players playing poker, I actually had him put me in that. So it was myself and a bunch of video games player, player, video game characters all playing poker. Um, and because of that, he had already like drawn me and he had, you know, put me into something. That's so awesome. he was able to easily just translate me into something else. I mean, he's yeah. super talented. It's, I say it's easy. I could never do it, but he was able to do it. Yeah, man. I, I mean, anytime you're an artist like that, it's a skill, it's a talent. And, and anybody that's really good at something typically makes it look easy to everybody else. And then you try it and it's like, wait a second, this isn't so easy. Yeah. So this yeah. was from Paper Lab Studios. Okay. Paper Lab Studios is, is his business name. So, you know. Okay. Are they local here to South Florida or where are they? Yeah. Yeah. He's local in South Florida. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So it's a nice local connection as well. Yeah, I wonder if he's done any stuff, uh, if he's been commissioned for anything in the Wynwood area because yeah, obviously there's so much artwork there. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I don't know if he has. It would be yeah. awesome if he could do something video game themed there. He does uh, all sorts of video game um, and comic book stuff. We have some of his pieces. He gave me some other uh, pieces that were already made and we have okay. those hanging up like in our technical marketing area. Yeah, We have like various video game posters and his artwork is pretty awesome. That's cool. That's very cool. So tell me a little bit about this. I've been jumping around a little bit. Obviously I was on your LinkedIn page, but I also uh, checked out your Twitter page and it seems like you guys are, uh, and I want to go back to your origin story after this, but a couple of things I just wanted to clean off the slate right away. Um, this fight disease together with us, help accelerate the research for COVID-19 and then uh, folding at home. So, yeah. so tell us a little bit about the cause, uh, obviously sure. it's about, you know, uh, accelerating the research for COVID-19 and then what does folding at home mean? So yeah, let's talk about Folding at Home. So Folding at Home is a nonprofit organization. Uh, and basically, what they, they've been around for a long time. And what they do is uh, they allow you to download their app, uh, their software onto your computer. Okay. And then you could sign up and, and you can basically utilize the power of your computer when you're not using it. So okay. during the nighttime, when you're, when you're sleeping, you could say, you know what, Folding at Home, take over my computer and use the power of my cores, my GPU, my CPU, and just tap into it and then do research on the internet. So it's like SETI. SETI at home is for doing like extraterrestrial um, uh, research, but folding at home uh, is really for fighting diseases. So you wow. don't get to pick the, the specific disease that you're fighting. Right. So it just, it grabs your, your um, PC and starts doing work um, on the internet, you know, through the cloud. So actual researchers that are researching these complex, uh, you know, uh, models, they, they, they basically are rendering the complex models uh, of the actual diseases and figuring out like more information. The more we can figure out on how these diseases, you know, are, are made up of, the right. more we can help fight them. So, so it's, it, it's taking the power from your computer or is it actually using your computer? So when you get back on your computer, you log in in the morning, do you see like all this research that's been done? Yeah, you, you log back in and the folding at home thing, like as soon as you take over, like wake it up big, basically, then it stops folding and it shows you like, oh, we've done this much folding, you know, while you're, while you're away. Uh, and then you could customize it. You could say, you know what, I only want to do this once a week or I only want to do it for one hour. You don't have to just make it work all the time your way. Right. Um, so we set up a, an Origin PC team. So basically you can set up a team and then you can recruit people and say, hey, you know, come join our team, come help us do research. So Corsair has joined, Elgato, Origin PC, some of our fans, uh, family, et cetera. And uh, I forget what our score is, but there's, you know, there's like tens of thousands of teams. And I think we cracked like the top 300 in teams from wow. zero to top 300. And then it also gives you a score. Um, so it gives you a score related to how much research you've done and how much you know, you've computed. And our, I know our score, I think, is over 1 billion now. It's crazy. 
Man, you know what? This is one of the reasons why I enjoy doing these podcasts and talking to people because I had no idea that this existed, you know, and, and this yep. is something that's, it's really, I mean, amazing. Like, it seems like it's obviously what it says, accelerating the research for COVID-19. So you're doing something really good for the globally. I mean, and, and then having statistics that back it up so you can kind of look at what you've done to, to help and then share that with other people. That's really cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I should actually take a look and see where, where our current rank is. Uh, but yeah, that's a, something we're currently doing and we're, you know, we're not stopping anytime soon and we're still encouraging people to join that. And it's one of those things where you can donate, you know, as little or as much as you want to. You don't have to be obligated to say, I'm going to donate, you know, uh, 50 hours a week. You could just right. literally do 10 minutes at what anything you do helps. Wow, that sounds really cool. I'll try to do that, and I'll, I'll start like just with a short. And and like you said, when you're sleeping, I mean, I, that shouldn't affect yeah. you at all. It'd be from midnight to six or whatever. I could just say, okay, pulling home, take over my computer, and uh, and and then I'll check it out in the morning and see what it did. That's that's really cool. So I I would love to share that with uh, with our listeners, and and I'll get yeah. some links to the show notes for that as well. Awesome. And then, yeah, we have we yeah. have it on our website, and I'll, you can send you the link and. They basically just, you click through to the folding at home website and it tells you how to set it up. It takes you pretty, five minutes to set it up. Pretty, pretty easy. And do you, so do you bring in people for your team at Origin PC just internally or do you also reach out to people like myself and do you suggest somebody join the team or should they just do it individually? Oh, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So we, we're recruiting people to our team, okay. uh, but you don't have to join our team. You could okay. create your own team. Yeah. Um, you could join other teams. There's a lot of teams that are, have been around, you know, longer than we have. Um, you know, anything. Any which way you want to do it helps out. We're happy if anyone just, you know, signs up and starts helping the cause. Awesome. Awesome. I, I'm going to, before we go into the origin story, because I just saw this in the back, dude, there's a lot of lanyards behind you right now. Yes. <laughs> and so I'm assuming that you go to a ton of events uh, yeah. and probably all over the world. Can you tell me about some, maybe like what, what your experience is when you started doing that? Okay. Like, and that may walk into your word origin story a little bit, but then, uh, also, as a CEO of a company, what's the difference between like a CEO going, because you're not working or manning the booths probably, maybe you did back in the day. What's the difference between you going today and when you first started? Because there is a difference, right? Experiencing yeah. one of those conferences as a CEO or as uh, someone that's working the floor at one of the booths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely uh, different, um, you know, different over the years. Uh, so I've been going to events for video game events for like 20 years. I think, I don't know for sure, but the first event I went to was either an Intel event. So it's like closed for Intel customers okay. or it was E3, uh, which E3 used to be closed for industry only. Yep. Uh, but like one of my first memories is definitely E3. Okay. So I don't know how many years ago this was, but an, an a really old memory that stands in my mind, um, like it's like burned into my memory is a good memory was going to E3 and going to the God Games lot. So okay. God Games was a division of Take-Two Interactive. And um, they had some really controversial booths and some controversial games at the time. Uh, Duke Nukem was one of them. Okay. Um, this was 20 years ago, so times have obviously changed. But right. um, uh, E3, the organization that runs E3, actually kicked them out of E3. They said, wow. no, you know, we don't like what you're doing. You know, you're breaking the rules. I think there were some very specific rules. And they was it controversial in the sense where it was, it was either violence related or sex related or anything like yeah. that? Okay. Yeah, both of those things. Okay. Um, and there were some very specific rules and they broke the rules. So, you okay. know, they kind of deserve to be kicked out probably because they broke the rules. I don't know the, the exact. But I find myself at this God Games lot, which was across the street. Okay. So they ended up renting a lot, renting the parking lot right across the from E3. They say, you right. know what, you kick this out, well, screw you, we're just going to rent uh, right. a parking lot from, from, from somebody in L.A. You know, right. nothing to do with E3, just happens to be right across the street. Right. So somehow we get invited to this, um, and we're, we're going around, and they had the different games. So they had um, uh, trailers. So the whole theme was like a trailer park, and they had different trailers, and you would walk around from one trailer and go inside that trailer, and then they would have a computer there, and then sit. everybody would sit around the computer, and that would be the demo of like an unreleased title. Okay. So we come into this uh, trailer, uh, you know, and you're at a trailer and you're like, you know, you have no idea what to expect as far as a video game. You're not expecting anything revolutionary or anything like that. But lo and behold, we, we sit down and um, there's like a screenshot. Uh, and it's a screenshot of a guy like jumping to the side and bullets whizzing by him. And it's basically Max Payne. So okay. it's a screenshot of Max Payne. And we're like, oh, this, look, this looks really cool. 
Right. And they're explaining to us like, oh, this is going to be a really new, cool third-person game. It's going to introduce bullet time where you could slow down time. The graphics are on another level, the 3D realism, etc. We think it's a screenshot. Then all of a sudden, that guy hits unpause, and that was the actual gameplay. Wow. So at the time, the graphics were so amazing that you know you thought it was not an in- and not we thought it was like a render, not an actual in-game screenshot. Right. Uh, so so lo and behold, it's in-game, and we're playing Bullet Time, Max Payne for the first time. Nobody's ever seen it before. This is like a world premiere type of thing. But it's also behind closed doors, so only you know select people are seeing yeah, it. Yeah, so it's VIP experience. Um, and that just blew my mind. So that yeah. game demo blew my mind. The whole thing of like how E3 booths that they just keep evolving. And every, even to this day, you know, every booth is kind of just changing and evolving. EA does their own thing outside of E3. Bethesda does their own thing outside of E3. Mm-hmm. There's still a lot of really cool booths inside E3. It's just crazy to see how it's changed over the years. Yeah. Uh, but to give you, so to answer your other question, what has changed uh, from me personally going to events? So uh, initially when I went to events, it was kind of just exploring, um, making contacts, you know, all new contacts, um, not having a lot of meetings set up, being free to kind of explore and see what's out there. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to today, and when I go to events, I'm really, you know, there to see people that I know. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been to so many different events, and, you know, I get, events are hard. They're, you get tired. It's multiple days of, you know, up early, up late, talking to a gazillion people, making a bunch of notes, action items for future follow-up. So pretty much at every event, I'm like, man, I have done E3 so many years. I'm tired. I don't think I'm going to come back next year. I think I'm done. Right. But then, you know, you know, forgetting COVID for a second. But then, you know, E3 comes around again, and I start thinking of all the people that I want to see. Like, oh, I want to see this guy. I want to see this girl. I want to see this person. Like all these friends that I've developed over the years, that's actually what draws me back to events. I yeah. want to go back and just reconnect with all the people that I've seen over the years, see how everybody's doing, check out, all, check out their new projects, maybe their new roles. A lot of people will move, to, you know, industry small, people move to different companies. Yeah. Uh, and then it's also still about making new contacts. So when I go to events nowadays, I really have a packed calendar of, you know, setting up as many meetings as I can to try to hit as many different things as I can. A mixture of old friends and a mixture of new people. So right. I try to see as much as I can and try to pack it in. I literally have every hour, every half hour, you know, calendar it out. Um, and then I even set some time across, um, in my calendar for just exploring. Because you have to, at every event, you have to give yourself some time to just explore and see what's out there. There's always new stuff. I agree. And I think also when sometimes you get into those conversations and you, you schedule everything out. Now, if we get into a really great conversation and you know you have something coming up right behind and you've got to leave because you've got that commitment, yeah. you can always say, hey, let's get together and continue this conversation because I did have, I scheduled some free time and, you know, maybe we'll walk the floor together. So we'll explore, but we'll be together again and we can continue that conversation. Yeah. And uh, the last PAX East, that reminds me of the recent PAX East, which was the last big gaming event before COVID really, you know, stopped everything. I went to that event and I was playing uh, the new Doom. I was able to play the new Doom and a demo and I was playing it on nightmare mode and it was kicking my butt. And I just got like this bug in my brain of like, I am not walking away from this demo until I beat this level on nightmare or they kick me off one of those two things. And luckily they, they just let me play. They didn't kick me off. And luckily I beat it uh, after a while. But after I emerged from this like focus, I realized I'm like, wait, I've been here way too long. I'm like, why didn't you guys kick me off? And they're like, oh, we, you know, we wanted to let you play and it was fun watching you play. I'm like, oh, you know, thanks for letting me play. That was super fun. And now I'm late to my next meeting. So I ended up being late <laughs> to my next meeting, but, uh, but it all worked out. Yeah, I'm sure you told the story and they probably were like, okay, that's all right. You yeah, it was, really a, good- it was a friend of mine. It was in the industry and doing, yeah. pitching me something new. And I was like, dude, I'm sorry I'm late. I was actually playing this demo. And he's like, I wish you would have told me. I would have come over there and watched right, you play. <laughs> right, right. You made a really good point, too, about energy. I, I know, like, a lot of those conferences, you really need to go in. You need to be well-rested. You need to get some good rest. And then you, you have to come to every meeting. What we're doing right now requires a lot of energy. And I think the reason it requires so much energy is because it's brain power. You want to be on point. You want to, you want to really be at your top level. And so to constantly do that throughout the day for three or four days over these conferences takes a lot of energy and takes a lot out of you. Yeah, yeah, and there's so many parties and events and, you know, so many things distracting you and keeping you up late and, you know, we don't even get to play any video games. I try to, I try to play one big game per, per conference 
Right. Um, so like I, I'll go early, I'll go like super early in the morning and the last day. And that's my one game that I can play. Yeah. So, um, one year I played E3 at E3. I wanted to play Zelda breath of the wild was there. And I'm like, I can't leave LA without playing breath of the wild. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's like my, you know, one of my favorite uh, game franchises of all time. So the last day of E3, I go super early. Um, I'm in the, and everybody else does the same thing. You know, that has an exhibitor badge. Everybody has the same idea. They're like, oh, I'll go early and make the line before the line actually starts. Yeah. So I go early and there's still a line. Like the show is not even open for a half hour and there's still a line. But I'm like, you know, I'll just join the line uh, because I think all of us will get in. Like, there was like 30 of us, but they had a big play area. So I'll, I'm like, I'll just, you know, wait here for 30 minutes, do some emails, uh, and then I'll get to play Breath of the Wild before the show even opens and then I'll go to my meetings. Yeah. So I'm standing there waiting in line and lo and behold, Reggie walks by, the president of Nintendo in America walks right by me because he's going into the booth and I happen to be like where the entrance is. Right. And I'm like looking at my email doing, you know, uh, looking at my phone doing emails. I look up and Reggie is walking right towards me. And I'm like, oh, hey, Reggie. He's like, hey. And he walks by and goes in. Right. And I was like, wow, that was one of my coolest experiences ever. I got to say hi to Reggie while <laughs> waiting to play Zelda. That right. was so cool. <laughs> that is cool, man. Well, obviously, you are a, 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 just a, an avid fan and gamer. And, and so tell us about what age that started at and that brought you into, I, I'm assuming, your career path right now and becoming CEO of Origin PC. So if you can, if you kind of just kind of, you know, rewind and go back to where you think this all started and obviously, you know, make it a, make it a briefer version because I'm sure this is one of those things that yeah. could, we could talk about it for, for like an hour and a half. And there's a number of things that I really want to ask you just about the speed of PCs today and, and, and laptops and everything else. So I, but I do want to hear about how it started because you, you're one of those people, man, you can just tell that you've been around gaming for a long time, but you really still love it and are extremely passionate about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't even know what age I started. It was super young, definitely. Uh, there's like three or four things that stand out in my mind when I think back to like, how did I really get hooked on gaming? Right. So, you know, I'll try to jump to them really, really quick. One of them was that I had a friend, um, and I think it was in junior high at the time. I had a friend whose dad worked at Nintendo. Uh, I have no idea what he did. You know, I was a, little, a kid at that time. I didn't really right. know much about jobs and business. Right. Uh, but I just know he worked at Nintendo. And therefore, he had access to all Nintendo games, any NES games. Okay. So I would go to my buddy's house every day after high school or uh, junior high after school, and play literally every NES game. So that was super awesome. I was super lucky to have access to that. That's yeah, one like, thing that's. Tell me out. some of the titles. Well, give me a few of the titles. Um. Oh man. The um. Uh. Obviously, the you know Super Mario and the obvious ones. But there's one I can't forget the name of it. But it was like a a, a little guy in an airplane side scroller. Okay. Okay. And you could like do a loop de loop and, and shoot people. There's a game like that that I would never buy. I would like, right. you know, this is not my type of game. I wouldn't buy it. I wouldn't spend time on it. But it's there for free. You'll try it out. Right. So that I remember that game was super fun. Yeah. Um and just like, you know, like every game you could think of. Uh obviously Zelda and Mario are the ones that stand out the most. Right. Um but uh there was also that side scroller, it was like Sky something, some sort of NES uh shooter. Okay. Uh, so that was console gaming. My family and was, also had a, and that was more of your junior high, like you said, coming up through junior high and high yeah, school. Yeah, I think that was junior high. Okay. So before that, my family had an Atari. So my dad's uh, work gave him a gift at the end of the year, and they gave him an Atari console. So okay. he gave that to the, to the family, of course, and the kids, and we were playing Atari, like War and Berserk, uh, Yars Revenge, yeah. Super yeah. Pitfall. Yeah. So that was a game. That's and then insane. also my, my parents had a computer. So my parents had a computer. My mom was super techie. She still is super techie and into games. She still plays games today. Okay. Um, she's playing Animal Crossing and Doom. Right. Uh, but um, she would bring me games. She brought me a shareware version of Doom. Uh, Doom or Doom 2, I think it was. Okay. And she knew what it was. <laughs> Even though I was a little kid and she knew it was violent, she was like, you know what, I think you're, uh, you, know, you can mature enough to sh play this game and, right. and, and, and like it and not be affected by it. So... I, I'm playing this game Doom and I'm like super hooked on the 3D environments. So that was another memory. Okay. I also had a buddy that I, I think it was also in junior high or maybe in high school, but I became friends with a guy that was like, this was before the, the internet was, was, was everywhere. You know, we had very, very basic internet. There was no websites. There was no review websites. There was no downloads of demos, but this guy was downloading shareware. 
So he was downloading shareware games, uh, like DOS games, putting them on 3.5 discs, and then selling them. So I would buy like a ton of games off this one guy. I would just go to his house, buy like a ton of discs. My mom would drive me over there. <laughs> she knew what we were doing. She's like, oh, sure, I'll drive you over there to buy a bunch of games. So I remember that, giving me access to a bunch of games. Okay. Um, and then, you know, luckily my, uh, my family, my parents, my, they allowed me to play all these games. I do remember my, uh, one of my siblings. I'm not going to call out any of my siblings specifically, <laughs> but one of them was super pissed that I was playing video games all day. Because they would leave in the morning, you know, like a Saturday, leave in the morning, I'm on the couch playing games. Right. They come back and, uh, when it's dark, I'm still on the couch playing games. <laughs> right. But they would go to my mom and be like, what are you doing? You can't let them sit home all day doing nothing, playing games. It's not healthy. It's not good, blah, blah, blah. But, you, you know, he had, sibling had a point to that. But I was lucky that my, my parents let me do that and, you know, let me be hooked on it and let me turn it into a career. So, so did you, because it really didn't exist uh, 25, 30 years ago, right? It didn't exist 20 years ago, I don't think. Uh, uh, go to school, college for gaming, esports, right. um, or did you jump straight into a career field? Were you into game development, game design? How did you take your passion and love for gaming? Because listen, there's a lot of people out there that, that love to game that'll probably never get behind and in, in, in the infrastructure side, and the back end of, of gaming, right? Designing that. Yeah. Um, and, and you did some of that, but you, you're in the PC side. You're, you're, you actually create the platform through which we play. Yeah. Right. So, so how, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, as when I was growing up as a gamer, it was actually not my intention or goal or path uh, initially that I thought, to, to go into PCs or go into hardware. So I, I know I love gaming and I know I wanted to work in the gaming industry. So I started working at EB Games, you know, slash GameStop. I started working at the local retailer because that was pretty much the only video game thing in Miami. Okay. So I started working uh, at EB Games and I set out a, my own path of saying, okay, I'm going to work at EB Games for a few years. I'll work my way up to manager. There's this thing called the manager's show where the managers go out to fly out to different areas and they get to play all the unreleased games okay. and they get to therefore meet all the gaming companies. So my idea was like, I'll work at EB Games, then I'll meet uh, like Activision or somebody and then I'll jump to that company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know how I came up with this, you know, 20 years ago, but that was my, my goal. That was your roadmap, I'll, I'll yeah. just, you know, yeah. it's, it's so easy. I'll just jump to another company. But that was my <laughs> idea that I'll just, you know, meet somebody, jump to a company and then I'll start making games. Right. So at the same time, I started studying computer science uh, uh, at uh, FIU. Uh, before that, I was studying. Uh, was it before that? Yeah, before that. Before that, I was at FSU and I was studying communications. Okay. So uh, communications, I studied uh, public relations, advertising, speech, uh, giving speeches, writing speeches, uh, and then I came back to Miami and I said, you know what, I'm going to focus on gaming and making games. So I started studying computer science. So here I am, I'm studying computer science, I'm working at EB Games. Uh, and then luckily I meet the owners of Alienware. They would come in to EB Games and uh, 25 years ago, there were no video game websites. There was no social media. There was really no way to know when you walked into a store, you, li you literally had no way of knowing whether you're buying a good game or a totally crap game. It's amazing, right? This so is just, they, 20, this, yeah, this is like just 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So uh, what happened was every customer would walk in and they would ask me, Hey, you work here. What's good? <laughs> so I ended up having like a ton of customers that were like, that would come in and just talk to me and I would talk to them about everything. Luckily I was a huge gamer and I literally played pretty much every game on the shelf. So I could tell them like, no, 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 avoid that game. It's, it's whole, total crap. Don't waste yeah. your money. And Dude, it hey, reminds check out this new game that it nobody knows me, about. Yeah. It reminds me of, of Blockbuster, you know, because that was the big days of Blockbuster yeah. too. Right. And you really didn't know that much. You always were asking the people behind the desk. I mean, they had like certain reviews, I think in Blockbuster about the movies yeah. that were coming out, but you really wanted to ask the person that was working there because they, just like you're saying, they watched every movie. You played every single game. Yeah. 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 So these, uh, these guys would come in and, um, and I noticed I had these Alienware shirts that they're wearing. Yeah. So just one day, I don't know, I just had like a, a bug in my mind of like, let me ask them if they're hiring. Even though I was on this other path, for some reason, I was just thinking like, you know, I need to explore other things. Did you know that they oh. were the owners at that time or did you just yeah, know? That no. they yeah, I just asked, like, hey, guy, uh, you work at Alienware, you guys have any job openings? He hands me his card and I'm like, 
president and owner. I'm like, holy crap, this guy's the owner. <laughs> like, I had no idea because you know they didn't dress in suits. They weren't looking like executives. Um, right. You know, but that's the tech industry. You don't, yeah. you know, you you wear jeans and a t-shirt. That's tech. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, lo and behold, I'm like, holy crap, this is the owner. So of course I, you know, tidy up my resume, send in my resume right away. I don't hear back for like weeks, uh, and then all of a sudden he calls me out of nowhere. And I'm at the store because this is a long time ago before everybody had cell phones. I didn't have a cell phone. Uh, and he's like, come in right now for an interview. And I'm like, dude, I'm working. <laughs> and I'm like, but I'm, I'm actually getting off in like 10 minutes. So I'll go home. I'll change. I'll print out my resume. I'll be prepared. And he's like, no, no, no. Just come now. Just come now. And this is Alex, one of the owners of Alienware. He's, and he's now known, you know, at the time I didn't know. But he's known. He's super passionate. And, you know, he can get you to do anything. You talk to him for five minutes and he will pump you up and you'll just be like, yes, we're doing that. <laughs> so that's what he did on the phone. He's like, no, awesome. no, 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 no. You're coming now. Come now. Let's talk now. I want to get this gun. That's great. Man. So it's a long story. But, yeah. No, uh, no, no. It's awesome, man. It's awesome. But, but that's how I ended up uh, at Alienware. Uh, and I was studying computer science. And then I actually hit a wall uh, in, in, study, in my studies. Uh, discrete math. I did calculus one. No problem. Calculus two. No problem. Discrete math. It was like not happening. I right. took that course like three times at every time I couldn't pass it. Discrete math is basically word problems mm -hmm. in reverse. So imagine um, getting numbers right. and then changing those numbers into a paragraph of words. I'm right. like, I still don't understand how this happens. Yeah. Right. But that's what it is. <laughs> it's going backwards. And um, I couldn't figure it out. So I, I, I said, you know what? Uh, oh, and then I had, you know, fast forward, I'm working at Alienware. So I really started liking Alienware. I'm like, you know, I think this company is going to go somewhere. I really uh, you enjoy working here. I love everything about it. Uh, school is kicking my butt right now. You know what? I'm going to put school on hold and kind of just put all my time and energy into Alienware. So I put school completely on hold for a couple semesters. And I started um, staying late at Alienware. And I started learning all other areas. Mm -hmm. So I had my job, but I started learning other jobs just to, just to learn them. Even though I had no no reason to do so, but I'm like, you know what? I want to kind of move up in this company. So right. let me just learn other things and as much as I can. So when you say other jobs, do you mean other areas in the business itself or do yeah. you mean other? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Marketing, yeah. sales. Yeah. I was in quality region. assurance. So okay. I, my job was to test every computer that left. So it was okay. like a dream job. Right. Um, but there was also integration, you know, which was putting all the drivers and OS on there. So I started learning integration. Then there was also assembly building them. So I would go to assembly after hours and if the, sometimes the guys or girls were there working late and I would just say, Hey, can you, can I just shadow you and you teach me some stuff? And everybody there was super nice. So uh, I was able to learn all, all sorts of different things while I was there. No, that's, but that's, that's great that you said that because that's one of the things you weren't just there doing your job. You were then looking to, okay, how do I advance myself and what do I have to do to get better? And one of the ways to do that is to shadow people in other positions. So you learn from the people that are doing that. That's, I mean, that's a great roadmap to, to success. So, so you did that yeah. and you're, you're still at Alienware at that point. Yeah. So, yeah. So I wanted to make the point that, you know, a lot of people want to work in the game industry, um, but don't be afraid to, you know, follow your passion, but then change paths a little bit. You know, that's yeah. what I did. I, I was like, I'm going to make games. I'm going to make games. I'm going to make games. But then I saw this opportunity, good experience, good company. I said, you know what? I'm going to get some game experience. Uh, I didn't know that this would turn into a whole career. Right. You know, I still thought in my mind that one day I'll go make games or one day maybe I'll work at Activision. Um, but it worked out because if you really, that's really your passion and you put everything into it, hopefully, you know, it's not guaranteed, but hopefully it'll work out for you. So yeah, sorry. I started learning the other, other, other jobs and Alienware was growing. So as the company started growing, they started needing to hire more people. They started needing more managers, you know, started needed to move people around. So, um, and I think it was 10 years, I had seven different promotions okay. uh, and more, more jobs than that. But the, the promotions were seven that I remember. Mm -hmm. And I did everything from quality assurance to tech support, to sales, to business development, to marketing. And then my highest uh, role there was uh, VP of marketing. Mm -hmm. So at one point I was VP of marketing. Uh, Alienware was like, you know, multi-million dollar company. I had a full staff underneath me. Um, and it was just, you know, it was kind of living the dream. I mean, we, the company was growing, video game, PC industry was growing. Uh, we were adding new products, desktops, laptops. Uh, it was just fantastic. 
So what made you then in, in, a, in, in one of the areas that I think is great is like you, you stayed in the gaming space. You didn't go the way that you actually thought you were going to go specifically, but then you all really had access because of what you're doing on the, on, the, on, the, on the computer side and on the PC side and working there, you were able to work with all those publishers, which is the area that you might, yeah. you might have thought. You, yeah. And, and maybe it's more fun because sometimes, and I know this from traditional pro sports and working in traditional pro sports, sometimes when you get behind the curtain, it's not as glamorous when you're behind the curtain as it is when you're in front, right? Like making the games can could be i'm sure it's a grind and there's probably quite a bit of stress because i know there's 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 timelines that you need to hit and you need to get things out so um but anyway i kind of digress you you were an alien where what what made you transition why did you want to move from vp of marketing and then all of a sudden you know now we have origin pc how did that happen so my when i started at alienware it was about 10 or seven people in the company and um richard carey started the same week that i did and then Hector Penton was already there. So the three of us were top seven employees. Um, we helped grow the company from seven to 700 worldwide. You know, a bunch of people helped, but we were, we were there as well. And uh, uh, then Dell, Dell came in and acquired Alienware. So Dell comes in, acquires Alienware uh, and says, you know, we're not going to change anything. We're going to let you guys operate here independently. So we're like, oh, this is awesome. We're going to learn the Dell secret sauce and we're going to grow even better. We're going to take it worldwide. Um, we we ended up finding out, you know, we we took some trips to Austin and and there wasn't exactly a secret sauce. <laughs> it was more like Dell is is you know has one of the first companies to do, maybe the first company to do like direct custom PCs, and their size is massive, so they have just a ginormous size, and they could like use their size to their advantage to to get better pricing, to to do deals, etc. Um, and then you know business is business, and and Dell ended up changing things taking Alienware more mainstream, mm -hmm. uh, you know, growing the Alienware business, but growing it in a way that it was kind of bringing it more mainstream. Right. So myself and my, you know, my two partners now, each of us still at Alienware, we kind of decided, you know what, Dell's not for us. <laughs> Nothing against Dell, but we didn't want to work for Dell. We wanted to go back. We, want, we were like, we want to go back to the beginning when, when it was all about super high performance, the best high performance PC you can make, the most customization you could offer and the best technical support. You know, to do that, you have to be a premium high-end product. You can't go mainstream and offer all those things because when you go more mainstream, you have to be a less custom, which, you know, so you can produce a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And then you have to save some money so you can lower your price to go more mainstream. So that's what Dell was doing. You know, they were going a little bit lower price, a little bit less features. Uh, but we wanted to go back to like, no, no, we want the ultimate, the best of everything. Mm -hmm. So we said, you know what? There's an opportunity here. Alienware used to be the number one, the most high end, and then they went mainstream. Voodoo PC was also super high end, a competitor of Alienware. They got bought up at HP, and they kind of you know went away. Uh, so we looked at the industry and we said, you know what? There's an opportunity here to go back and fill that that gap. There's a gap of the, the super super high end PC. So we looked at the opportunity. We also said, this is what we love to do. This is what we know how to do. Uh, you know, we're, we we want to work hard for ourselves. Um, so let's start, let's try it. <laughs> so the three of us left and we said, we're going to go back to the beginning. And that's the name of the company origin. It's about going back to the origin, going back to the beginning of Alienware and kind of starting over. Uh, we did that in 2009 when the PC industry was in flux. Uh, the economy was not doing well. Uh, it was not a good time to start a business. Right. Uh, Xbox 360 was really like taking over the gaming world. Right. PC gaming was not as strong as it was today. It's hard to imagine this, but but like Blizzard, World of Warcraft wasn't as strong as they were today. Steam wasn't really around as much as they are. Uh, and those two things, Steam and Blizzard, World of Warcraft, that changed PC gaming forever. Because before that time, people were pirating PC games like crazy. Everybody would just copy the game, copy the game, and not pay for it. So game developers said, you know what? If everybody's just going to copy my game, I'm not making money. I'm going to do more console exclu exclu exclusives. Yep. So Xbox 360 was taking off, console exclusives were taking off, PC gaming was kind of fading away, um, you know, but, but we didn't drink the Kool-Aid. This okay. story comes up every few years that okay. PC gaming is dying. Um, and that time it was, you know, it, it wasn't looking great. But thankfully, Steam with their digital uh, DRM, where now you have to go online and register your game. I remember Half-Life 2 was one of the first games where it forced you to go online and register the game. Like I bought the physical game, at the store, 
but I have to right. physically go to, I have to go online to this thing called Steam. It was ridiculous. Everybody was pissed off. Right. Uh, but, but when you look back on it, that saved PC gaming because mm. people could not pirate the game. You had to buy the game. So Valve created a path of like, this is how you can actually make money in PC gaming. This is how you can stop people from pirating your game. Right. And then, that and, was then, one people, path and, then people, and then people bought in because once they did it the first time, then, then it just becomes the norm. Yeah, then all these indie game developers started making money. The big game developers noticed like, hey, we could actually make a lot more money on PC than console. Uh, World of Warcraft took off. So World of Warcraft is an online-only game. There's no way you can pirate that. It's only online. You know, nowadays it's like obvious. Of course, online gaming is no big deal. But right. 20, 25 years, 10, 25 years ago, uh, online gaming was not, every game was not online. There was a, one or two games that were online and that was it. Yeah. So these online games really showed that you can make money uh, without a physical product and without people pirating with and, and blocking people from pirating. So, so these, so. these things kind of happened at the same time that you guys make this leap, which is a leap of faith. Right. And, yeah. and tell me like how you funded that, because what you guys are doing is not something where you're starting just a service company. I mean, everything you're doing is hardware. So you've got to be buying the parts and then putting them together. And so you make that leap of faith and then, and all of this happens, like you say with steam, so it, it happens and, and the timing is actually pretty good, even though it didn't, might not have looked like that on the yeah. surface. At the time. Yeah, luckily the timing was perfect. Right. Um, and basically we started the three of us, so and we hired one employee. So we recruited one employee um, and there was the three of us and we said, we're going to pay our employee for the first year, but we're not going to take a salary. Yeah. So we invested our own money to start it. And then we also, you know, lived off our own money for one year. Right. Uh, I racked up some credit card debt that, that year. <laughs> uh, I became uh, very good at like, you know, maxing out a credit card and then shifting that debt to a different credit card with a 0% <laughs> APR. So I would have like 0% interest for right. six months or three months and then move it to another credit card, have 0% interest for a few months. Yeah. And, and then luckily, uh, Origin worked out and I was able to now pay off all those credit cards. Right. But I went into debt for that first year a little bit. Um, and yeah, we started with just one employee uh, we had uh, a few products, I think maybe two, three, four, four products total, okay. uh, a desk, a gaming laptop, a gaming desktop. Our first sale ever was a game, an 18 inch gaming laptop. Uh, the sale is still printed out and, and hanging in our, in awesome. our lobby. Yeah. Uh, and we remember that, that, that gentleman, he was the first one to really take a risk and say, you know what, uh, this is a new company, make it some, looks like a cool product. I'm going to buy it. So right. he spent, I think $4,000 on a, on a PC. Okay. Which four thousand dollars online now is is not that big of a deal. It's still a lot of money, right. and you know not common. But if you think to ten years ago, spending three thousand, four thousand dollars online without seeing a, a a person or physical product is just insanity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we were able to convince people that no, we're legit. We have backing. We have people backing us. Um, we hired uh, at that time. We did a deal with Fatality. So Jonathan uh, Wendell's uh, the esports godfather one of the best gamers to ever live. And he's a friend of mine. And I reached out to him um, and he said, hey, we're starting this new company, um, but nobody's going to believe that we're cool, we're, that we're good and we're legit and that we're the best um, because we don't exist. <laughs> it's just us saying right. we're the best. Of course, we need a third party validation. Like yeah. we want to send you some products. If you love them, then let's sign a deal and, you, you, and we can use your, your name and your picture and quotes from you. Mm -hmm. So we sent him products. He loved it. And he said, yeah, let's do a deal. So we did a business deal together. And when we first started the company, all of our val third-party validation was one person, <laughs> Fatality. We had right. like quotes from him all over the website of him saying, these are the best, fastest PCs, the most custom. Um, it helps me with my esports gaming. And you know, you should, you should buy their PCs. So that's, yeah. my, that's what started it all. But that's really important in business and that you guys knew that as well is, 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 is says something about your business acumen, building out that credibility and legitimizing who you were, even though you came from Alienware and you could say that, uh, having somebody else outside of the company say, these guys are legit, they're for real, um, that speaks volumes. And then once that happens and that first domino falls, then it starts becoming a little bit easier. But saying that, so you went out and got your first customer. I know you guys are still really customize things. Who are your typical customers these days? Because it sounds like these are people that really are into high performance. And then I kind of want you to talk a little bit about the customization of things. Because when I went and visited with you last year, two years ago at the facility at the warehouse, I was just blown away. I mean, some of the stuff you guys do is so cool. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's, okay. it's super cool to give people tours because it's one thing when we talk about it and it's another thing when you see it happening. You see literally people hand building these PCs, taking their time, tidying up the, the cables, uh, then you see it pass from one you know assembly area to an integration area, and and then you see the packaging. Like it's really, really a hands-on, one of a kind. P- every single PC is like handled like a piece of art, yeah. or like as if it was your own PC. You take super care of it. Um, so, um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> no, no. So yeah, so that was it. It was kind of about the customization, yeah. and, and you can and you can keep talking about that a little bit. Oh, but I'm yeah. assuming that be- PCs. yeah, because of yeah. the customization, at one of the things that you guys are have such a, a sh- strong part of your core philosophy is service. So if yeah. it's all, if it's not just, you know, machine driven, if it's all hand pieced together, then I'm sure that there's, that's one of the reasons why you can service, you know, people so well, because people know exactly what they did to build that PC out. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the people that buy from us are people that are looking for either something custom uh, or most of them are gamers or hardware enthusiasts. Um, or they're and or they're looking for industry leading support. They're looking for like US based support. So we all of our products come with twenty four seven lifetime US based support. It's our in house support team. We don't outsource it. It's not a script. It's not when you call our support line. It's not a script. It's literally just people picking up the phone. Like you know, how can I help you? What's going on? And right. then you talk about what's going on, and then they you know dissect it from there. Right. Uh, a lot of our, our support people are gamers. They're all enthusiasts. They're all very well trained uh, and they share information. So we're, we're able to talk to you just as a regular person and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Oh, you're, you're blue screening. Let's try this. Oh, your, your game is having this issue. You know, I play that game. I know about that issue. Here's what you do. Um, so that's on the support side. Uh, and then we also have, um, you know, gamers that buy from us. A lot of our business is just one computer to one person. Uh, but with then we have a, a large percentage of our business that's also going to other businesses so companies so activision has bought pcs from us bethesda has bought pcs from us twitch uh lockheed martin boeing uh the local miami Dade police department um all sorts of government agencies so these types of uh organizations are buying from us because they also want something custom so they want something that's built to spec that they can do whatever high-end you know computation or software that they're running and then of course again they want the support Right. So, you know, they want to know that they can just call us and then we'll help them out and that we're not, that, not going to outsource them to some scripted, you know, it's not going to be a, a long, painful process. Instead, right. it's a very helpful process. Um, and then a lot of our business is word of mouth. People buy from us, they like it, they tell their friends and that helps us, helps people come to us and say, hey, my buddy said you guys are really good. Or I bought one PC three years ago, I want to buy another one. So, right. And the customization as well. I mean, that's the interior. It's the hardware and software. But one of the things I noticed that's so super cool is that you guys, and you were talking about creating artwork earlier. A lot of your PCs, when I walked through the warehouse, were actually pieces of art. So the the outside, the casing was artistic. And, and so you can design the outside as well, correct? Kind of like you did with your avatar. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you could do any piece of art you want on the side of your PC whether it's an avatar, whether it's an actual photo, you know, looking photorealistic picture of yourself or your family, a video game uh, art. Um, you know, obviously there's licensing there, so we, we can't just take a, an image of a video game, put it on there. But if you create a piece of art that's a, in the spirit of a video game, we could put that on there. Um, and then, of course, any color you want. So on the exterior, we can do glass panels. We could do solid panels with artwork. Um, we could do solid colors. We could do patterns. Um, but then also the internal is also, in my, my you know, in, in my opinion, is artwork, right? Because we cable it so tidily, tight, tight and tidy that we hide everything. And you could choose the so down to the level of detail and customization. You could actually choose the color of the liquid, the color of the tubes, the color of the internal power cables. So uh, and also obviously with uh, IQ, the color of the lighting can all be synced up, yeah. or you could have no lighting. You know, and you can yeah, have any shape and size that you want, small form factor, large PC, laptop, et cetera. 
Yeah, man. It's again. I just I think about like twenty five, thirty years ago, in in a computer, and it just was a box, and you know, it just it, there was nothing about it really that was appealing. And a lot of times, you want to stick it under your desk, right? But the stuff that you guys make is like you want to put it on top of your desk. You want people to see it because it's just yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, it really is. It's amazing. It, it I don't know. It's just like anything. When you have something that's artistic, you like to see it and when you see that gaming PC and you see that it's liquid cooled and that it's like some neon green liquid rolling through there and I, they're awesome, man. Like I'm, 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 and, and people can go to your website and they can see some of these, right? Yeah. So actually on our website, uh, originpc.com, of course, plug. Um, but on the website, we have a full configurator. So we've built our own uh, very, very smart backend. So our, our, our awesome product team here, they, they put all the data into that product, um, product cart, um, OCAR is what we call it okay. uh, internally. And basically, they um, uh, make a smart system uh, of telling the system, uh, the backend, of telling our backend, you know, this motherboard can have this many uh, video cards on it. This motherboard is compatible with this memory. This GPU needs this power supply. So all that is done by our team in the backend so that you as a user, when you go through our configurator, if you configure something that doesn't work, the website will tell you, okay. like, oh, hey, you've, cho you've chosen that yeah. high-end GPU. However, you've chosen not a, a matching high-end power supply. Okay. So if you want to continue, you need to match, you need to upgrade your power supply. Okay. Or and let's say you're, you're shopping processors. You know, you pick this one processor, you switch to a different processor. It'll no notify you, hey, that processor is a different motherboard chipset, so therefore we've changed your motherboard to this motherboard now. Okay, and then, and then optimizes and maximizes what the, what the machine can actually do. Yeah. All right. Um, talk to me a little bit about speed because one of the things, uh, you know, we, I mean, just in gaming in general, you, know, you hear lag, you hear latency, which you, you don't, you want zero, right? That's yeah. what everybody wants, zero. But where are we today compared to, and if you want to go uh, work it down a timeline 20, 25 years ago to maybe 10 years ago to today, and then looking ahead five, 10 years, I just, there's got to be at some point, I always think there's a ceiling, right? There's only so fast. <laughs> that something can go, right? And then, and then, but it always seems like there's something coming out faster. So I'd love to hear, you know, what, what we've done so far in the last 25, 30 years regarding speed of these computers and what you see the future looking like. And then also, if you can talk about PC versus laptop. Sure. Uh, let's do PC versus laptop. That's a shorter one. And then okay. um, just the evolution of gaming and, and what's, what's going to happen next. Right. Uh, so desktop versus PC, uh, desktop versus laptop. To me, the lines are very, very, very blurred uh, because the laptops are so powerful. So our, our latest laptop where we just launched, our EN 17X, we actually, our tagline is that it's more powerful than your desktop because it literally is more powerful than most people's desktops. Uh, it's crazy how powerful it is. And it has a desktop processor in it. Even our thin and light laptops have a 2080 Max-Q in them, have Intel 10th Gen, I think eight core processors. So it's just a ridiculous amount of power in a laptop versus a desktop. You could take your laptop, plug it into your TV at home, plug it into your monitor at home, and it's just as good as a desktop. Okay. Now, desktop obviously is more powerful. So if you want to drive 4K, you know, a maximum hundreds of frames per second, um, then you're going to want to go with the desktop. If you want to add a capture card in there, uh, any other uh, cards, you know, inside the, the desktop, um, if you want an insane amount of memory, like 128 gigs of memory, because you're doing, you know, rendering video games or working with gigantic Photoshop files, then you go with the desktop. Um, so for most users, laptop or desktop works fine. If, if, you, if you need an insane amount of power, you probably know that you need a desktop. Right. Okay. So as far as gaming, how things have changed, I mean, nobody could have predicted 10, 15 years ago where we'd be today. And therefore, nobody can predict the next 5, 10, 15 years. Who knows what will happen? Uh, I do know that things will definitely keep evolving. There's always ways to get better. It does feel like this is like insane amount of graphics and detail that, you know, how could it possibly get better? Uh, but there, there's so many different things that are not happening. You know, photorealism uh, is, is kind of there, but uh, lighting is not uh, as realistic um, as it could be. However, with ray tracing, now real-time ray tracing, lighting is totally real as in real life however not all games have have adopted that so more and more games are going to adopt ray tracing uh so the games I, by the way i have no I, I have no idea what that means what's ray tracing 
So ray tracing is the, like the tracing of the light uh, of actual every single beam of light. Okay. So uh, a better way to explain it would be uh, when you play a game without ray tracing, uh, the game developers will set up the lighting and it's all fake. Okay. So when you go into a room and there's casting a shadow, that's because the game developer put a light somewhere to make it cast that shadow. And they put another light somewhere else in the room to make it a little bit lighter. And they put another light, they hide like lights all, all over the place, which you're not aware of. But the lighting looks realistic. You know, when you play a game, you play Call of Duty, the lighting looks super realistic. You go, in, you go into a dark room, it's dark. You go outside, it's lighter. At nighttime, it's dark, etc. cetera. Right. However, um, when you turn on real-time rail tra ray tracing, it's taking the source of light and it's actually bouncing the rays of light all over the place and creating realistic shadows on the fly, real-time. So, for example, um, the first demo that I remember playing uh, was that I, I peeked my head into, a, uh, I was outside and I peeked my head into a house and it was super dark in that house. Um, and then I couldn't see anything. I was just super dark, can't see anything. Um, and then all of a sudden, there's like a guy shines a flashlight and there was somebody in there. So uh, if, you, if you don't have real-time ray tracing, basically the game developers will, will add some fake lighting so that you can see that guy. Right. So that you don't have complete darkness. Right. But real-time ray tracing can actually give you areas of complete darkness, areas of shadows, areas of complete light, realistically. Um, and it's something, that, it's something you have to experience. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. once you experience the two different things, then you're like, oh, now I get it. Uh, and, and, and by the way, when you experience real-time ray tracing and you go back to games without it, you then get this immediate sense of like, this is so ridiculously fake. How did I believe this? <laughs> right. Which yeah. is kind of, if people don't think it's hard to believe, but if you, a lot of gamers think of an old game that you've played, think of the memories of playing that game and how awesome it felt and how realistic it kind of felt, and then go fire up that old game. Like this happened to me with Bushido Blade. I remember playing Bushido Blade. It was one of the best games. You could, you know, fighting people one-on-one -on -one samurai. It's super realistic from back in the day. And then I saw screenshots of it and I'm like, this looks like complete crazy, fake, stupid, real, you know, unrealistic, you know, how did I ever believe that this was a real, get the feeling of a real game, of a real, of real <laughs> right. sword fighting. Right. But that's how it is. Like, like the game developers will bring you into the world and you'll start believing it. You kind of forget exactly the graphics. You'll just feel it and believe it. Yeah. Uh, so now they're becoming more advanced and, and it's even more realistic and more believable. Yeah, man, it's incredible. It's, it reminds me a lot of, uh, I showed my kids the other day, you know, because we're going through Corona and everything. So they, they don't have any sports on, right? So I, there was, for some reason, I'm from Syracuse, New York. There was a Syracuse basketball game on when they won the national championship. Um, and so I showed them a little bit of that. The, the, what we're so used to today with HD, right? Yeah. When you, see a pro, when you see a college or a pro sports game from 20, 25 years ago, you're like, oh my God, how did I watch this? It's yeah. so blurry exactly. it's, it's yeah. incredible and then when you talk about it on the gaming side i just throw myself back to like and it, it always dates me but when i talk about pong you know and you talk about i remember the first football game i played on atari which was like three squiggly guys that would like you know go across the screen and shake and and there was like real no there was zero realism to it but at that time it was amazing like i, I yeah. played it all the time exactly and then you went from the first version of Madden to what there is today. I, it's just, it's incredible. And that's why I, I appreciate you sharing some of the actual technology behind it because the stuff that's going on is, and, and again, it just, it's just like anything, right? It just, it's, you're on the shoulders of the people before you. So it just keeps advancing because now you've gotten to that place and it just takes you to the next place, to the next place. Where do you see mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, you know, those spaces within what, what you do uh, and just where that, that trajectory is going? I'm glad you asked about that because I was going to try to interject VR in, into this because uh, as we're talking about advancements in gaming, it's not just the graphics. Uh, the, realist, the realism, but the level of immersion, you know, how you can interact with it. So I'm recently playing uh, Half-Life Alex. It's the best VR game I've ever played by far. It's re super realistic uh, environments. Uh, the gameplay, the story, you know, Valve is, is always really, really, really good at this. And I, I actually have been playing this game and it's the only game that I can remember recently that when I, you know, I played for a few hours uh, and then when I, at the end of the night, when I go to sleep, I you know, lay down to go to sleep and I kind of think of my day and the different things that I did uh, and what I'm going to do tomorrow. I, when I think of the game, I think of like 
not a game. I think of like I actually lived and did wow. these things in that world. Like I actually visited this right. place and right. actually walked up those stairs and actually fought those guys. Wow. It's so crazy and realistic that you, you literally feel like you're there. And, um, you know, when something jumps out of you, like you get crazy scared. You jump back like, whoa, I can't believe that just happened. Right. Um, but then the game has, you know, I don't want to have give any spoilers or anything, but the game has like a new gameplay mechanic that's totally different. Um, so it allows you to interact with things and then just the loading of the weapons. Like I, I remember when I first fired up the game, I was not loving it because I was getting my butt kicked and I was like fumbling around and I was, you know, I would get scared. I see an enemy, I would get scared and I, I wouldn't know how to reload my weapon because it's not just press a button and you reload. Right. You know, this is a, a, a different level of realism. It's press one button to eject the, the magazine. It's reach behind your back to grab a new magazine load the magazine, press a different button to, to then, uh, you know, cock the gun and get ready and then aim the gun. Right. So, you know, you're running out of bullets a lot in this game. So you're constantly having to reload and then there's like a shotgun and you have to reload that. So it's, you know, there's a learning curve to get there. Yeah. Uh, but once you get there, then, you know, now I'm like really good at reloading and things, but I, of course I still get scared and still die. Right. Uh, but I don't have that, that initial, you know, when I first started playing it, I was like, wow, this game is just like, there's, too much going on, too many buttons. You know, it's kind of like when you, when you look at NES versus PlayStation versus computer games, like, you know, they add more realism, they add more buttons, and it becomes, therefore, it becomes harder to play. Yeah. So VR is the same thing where it's adding more buttons, more ways to interact. It, it's not something you just pick up and you can master. You have to pick it up and learn the new buttons, learn the new controllers, learn the new ways to interact. And then once you learn it, you're like, wow, this is, a, a, this is now a new level of gaming that's, that's been achieved. Right. And, and it kind of reminds me, you know, when you say that when you go to sleep at night, when somebody learns a new language, when I think they finally actually learn the new language, they, they talk about dreaming in the language. Right. Yeah. So, that, so if you're learning, if you're, if you speak English and you're learning French, when you go to sleep, you can, you actually start dreaming in your, some of your dreams, the people speak the language that you're learning. And so to what you're saying, and, and it kind of falls back on that quote and I forgot it the other day, but I think it's, I'm a gamer, not because I don't have a life, but because I choose to have many. Right. Yes, and yeah. When you, yeah. And when you say what you're saying, it feels like your, 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 your life, the, the one that you have right now, is starting to integrating with another one that you're creating through, through gaming, but then now through virtual reality as well, dude. I don't know where this this is going crazy places. Yeah, no, there's been so many awesome, uh, so many mind blowing like game announcements in the past like two or three weeks, and it's gonna wrap up in June and July. We're gonna have insane amount of new game uh, information, right? Uh, new releases coming out, new games being teased, uh, Cyberpunk. I think middle of June is going to give more information on what they're working on. I mean, I can't wait for the next two months. <laughs> yeah. So the E3 and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of tie things up now, but E3 is not happening. And I saw something on a, it was either on your Twitter or your LinkedIn where you it was a June 5th seems to be a date where maybe there's going to be uh, more of a digital or a virtual release or a conference. Can you talk yeah. about, yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit about that and then, and then we'll kind of close up. Yeah, there's a bunch of different things going on. So yeah, unfortunately, E3 is not happening. Uh, however, a lot of online events are happening. There's one that already happened, which was an indie one, which uh, was not as big a scale as what's coming soon. So um, I think it's June 5th. I'm not sure the exact date. And, and there's so many different ones that honestly, I don't know all of them. Okay. Uh, but IGN.com is covering a lot of stuff. I think they have something called Summer Game Press. Oh no, not IGN. IGN has like Summer Games that they're calling it, that okay. they're doing a bunch of things. And then... I think Jeff Keighley has his own show called the Summer Game Fest. And if you go to summergamefest.com probably or something like that, mm -hmm. you can see the schedule of all the different things that they're going to announce. Okay. And then Ubisoft is doing their own announcement. PlayStation, I think, is doing their own announcements. Other people are doing stuff. So uh, that's what's happening. Instead of just being one E3, now we're getting like literally two months of announcements going, going forward. It's just going to be insane. Yeah, so your expectations of summer is going to be nuts. Yeah, just the announcements and... Uh, some games will probably be announced like, boom, they're ready to play. Like Mafia did their announcement recently of the trilogy. And uh, I think Mafia 2 okay. uh, was like, boom, it's right, right, re remastered, ready for you to play right now. Uh, Mafia 2 and 3, I think. And then right. Mafia 1 is like a complete redo that's going to be ready in August. Right. Uh, and then Crisis Remastered has been announced. That's going to be coming at some point. Uh, I don't know if this year or next year. Uh, but um, there's, yeah, it's just crazy how many games are coming out. 
That's awesome, man. Is there anything that we didn't uh, talk about that you kind of wanted to touch on? Uh, whew, nothing I could think of right, right off the top right. of my head. I mean, you know, thank you for having me. You, you covered all the different areas and no, it's man. great yeah. to catch up with you. I always appreciate you inviting me to local gaming esports events. It's, it's great to, to, to always link up with you. Yeah, we didn't even talk about any of those things. We'll talk about that in the next one. But I appreciate, uh, I, first of all, your time, your energy, just like your knowledge, man. You know so much about the gaming industry, and it's always fun to talk to you, and you teach me so much. So thanks a lot, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Anytime. All right, man. Thank you. Ciao. All right. See you next time. All right. I'd like to thank Kevin for sharing his time, experience, and knowledge with us today. I tip my hat to anyone that can stay true to their calling and their mission and apply business principles that are customer-driven first and yet still achieve a very high level of success. It just doesn't happen that often. To hear how he did it, you can listen again, and you can also find timestamp segments of the show, links to Kevin's social pages, and more information about his company, projects, and media in the show notes. If you enjoyed our discussion, please let us know. Continue the conversation with me across all social platforms, and become a part of the Ultimate Gamer community today by subscribing at ultimategamer.com. We release a new show every day of the week, Monday through Friday, so be the first to join us for some outstanding upcoming guests and or dive back into the library of previous Level Up pods to hear from some of the most brilliant minds in the space. Experts like CEO of World Gaming and Collegiate Star League, Wim Stocks, VP of Partnerships at Complexity Gaming, Ashley Chalk, and Head of Strategic Alliances at HyperX, Wendy Lacotte, just to name a few. You can find all of these episodes and more on the Ultimate Gamer website on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And finally, please like, rate, review the show. It helps us reach the gaming community to spread the word and share the wisdom of our guests, as well as some of the most thought-provoking stories in the industry. Shout out, as always, to the Ultimate Gamer. I look forward to being with you on the next Level Up Podcast. Yeah.